Hello, I'm Stan Honda. I'll be showing what I call night sky landscapes for this evening's UACNJ talk. I'm a professional photographer based in New York City, and I'm a board member of the Amateur Astronomers Association, or AAA. The AAA is a member club of UACNJ, and I, and I have brought our photography classes to Jenny Jump in the past for a night of darker sky shooting. You can see more of my photos on my website at stanhonda.com. I'm also on Instagram and Facebook. For 34 years, I worked as a photojournalist, much of that with Agency France Press, the French wire service. I covered a wide variety of assignments in New York, around the US, and in other countries. Two pictures that I took during the September 11, 2001 attacks on the World Trade Center are well known. The woman covered in dust and the man walking through the rubble. These were used in media around the world and are on display in the 9-11 Memorial Museum in Lower Manhattan. For almost five years, I had a great assignment covering the space shuttle program. I went to Florida for 11 launches and about 15 landings. It was amazing to see the vehicles up close and the workings of Kennedy Space Center. I followed the space program since I was a boy. So seeing an actual launch was a thrill for me. If you've wondered what it's like to be in a gaggle of photographers, here's a frame grab of me and friends working in the photographer's bench during the Williams sisters match at the US Open Tennis. A friend posted this photo on Facebook and we all got a laugh out of it. I left AFP in late 2014 to work on two general projects. One is about the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. I'm working with a Los Angeles-based writer named Sharon Yamato. Both our families are part of this history, part of American history. Our parents and their families were held in camps in desolate areas of the country, and we wanted to tell this story. In 2017, we published a book, Moving Walls, The Barracks of America's Concentration Camps, and a documentary video. You can find out more information on the book and video on my website. While in Wyoming working on the project on a somewhat clear August night, I was able to photograph a former barrack from the Heart Mountain Confinement Center, a site where Japanese Americans were forcibly held. It's one of my favorite photos from the book. That brings me to my other big project, what I call night sky landscapes. Here's a photograph of really big trees along Sprague Lake in Rocky Mountain National Park with the Milky Way in the sky. You can also see a bright Mars near the horizon and the branches of the tree on the left. This is not just a picture of the sky and stars, but one of the surrounding landscape. This picture places you in a certain location. I really shoot landscapes, but at night with the sky is an important element of the image. Most of the work I do is in the American Southwest, and this is why. You pr have probably seen satellite images of artificial lights. Here is most of North America. You can see much of the eastern part of the country is very bright, while big sections of the west are relatively dark. Most of the US and world population can't see the Milky Way from where they live. The stars are still up there, but excess lighting overpowers this view. Just being out under the stars is a great experience. Many of these trips have been with my friend Rush Dudley, here observing through his telescope from Petrified Forest National Park in Arizona. I'll talk to you about what you can photograph with DSLR or mirrorless cameras and ordinary lenses. A good sense of what is visible in the sky helps to get interesting photos. Apps such as Stellarium, Sky Safari, Photo Pills, and the photographer's ephemeris are great aids. Often an ordinary star chart and compass is all you need. I've been fortunate in being selected to participate in several artists in residence programs in national parks out west. It is a great program for artists to live and work in an amazing environment. It's a perfect way to do extended periods of night sky photography. I'll show work from some of these parks. There's a lot in the sky that can be photographed. 
One year ago, I was in Haleakala National Park on the island of Maui in Hawaii as the artist in residence for the whole month of March. Haleakala is a dormant volcano over 10,000 feet high. You can see many astronomical objects or phenomena from Haleakala or other dark sky sites, which I'll show here. From an overlook at over 9,300 feet, here's the Milky Way stretching across the sky with a rising crescent moon near the horizon and Venus, while Saturn and Jupiter are higher up. In this one picture, we can see four planets, including the one I'm standing on, our moon, and much of the galaxy. The lights of the big island of Hawaii can be seen on the horizon. I added annotations of the objects and included Antares, a huge red giant star that is part of the constellation Scorpius. That same morning, minutes after I shot the previous photo, the moon and Venus rise as dawn starts from the same viewpoint. During the month I was at Haleakala, I spent some time hiking into the crater of the volcano. It's a completely different environment with many endemic plants which are unique to Haleakala, such as the Ahina Hina shown here, or silver sword plant, lit by an almost first quarter moon. Many of my photos are planned around the lunar phases, and I let the moon light the environment around me. In this way, the landscape from near to far is lit, but the stars are still visible. Separate from the National Park is the Haleakala Observatories. It is closed to the public, but I was able to get permission from the University of Hawaii Institute for Astronomy to be on the grounds after dark. I wanted to try to photograph the domes with the spectacular sky behind them. On the left is one of the PANSTAR telescopes, and to the right is the Daniel K. Noe Solar Telescope, just coming online. A very bright Jupiter is seen in the Milky Way just above the PANSTAR's dome. One phenomenon that, that can be seen from very dark locations is the zodiacal light on the left side of this picture. It's a cone of light that extends up from the horizon after sunset in the spring and before sunrise in the fall. Sunlight reflecting off dust and particles along the plane of our solar system produces this light, which also is along the constellations of the zodiac. At the top of the photo, you can also see the Pleiades. In the center between the zodiacal light and the Milky Way is the Andromeda galaxy. At two and a half million light years from us, it's the farthest object you can see with the naked eye from a dark site. Even above the lights from the towns and cities on the island of Maui, these objects can be seen and photographed. I made this panorama of a full moon rising from near the summit of the mountain to take in the grandeur of the scene. The dark band along the horizon is the Earth's shadow being projected onto the atmosphere from the sun, which is set behind me and the edge of that shadow is curved, showing that we indeed, indeed live on a sphere. This panorama is composed of eight frames, which then I assembled later in my computer. Part of Haleakala is at sea level. The Kipahula section is very tropical and a much different environment than the summit. While cloudier and often wetter, when the sky clears, the view of the stars is stunning. Most of these photos were taken with pretty wide angle lenses. The one I use most is a 14 to 24 millimeter Nikon on my Nikon D850. I also use a Sony A7R3 for many of the photos. I'm always looking for interesting compositions and ways to frame the sky. I was walking on a trail around Bear Lake in Rocky Mountain National Park when I looked up through a grove of ponderosa pine trees and saw this. To me, it looked like a big star pattern with the summer Milky Way almost at the zenith. The aurora borealis or northern lights make dramatic pictures. My one and only time seeing the aurora was on the island of Spitsbergen, Svobard in 2015. I had gone there to see a total solar eclipse and 12 hours later, we witnessed this amazing display. 
The aurora was so big it went past the edges of my wide angle lens and directly above our heads. So far, all of these images, except the panorama, are single frames. For me, this approach preserves the integrity of the scene, both the land and the sky. I work to make the image as natural as possible to try and produce a picture of what I saw with my eyes and what I felt as I stood there. As a photojournalist, I work mostly in natural light and I'm continuing that with the night sky photos, only using moonlight or the natural light at that hour to illuminate the landscape. The next few examples, I did create composite photo out of many frames. How do we know the earth is rotating on its axis? Still images can show how Earth moves through time and space, as in the star trail example. In the center of the concentric circles is Polaris, the North Star. The other stars appear to rotate around Polaris. Of course, it is us, the Earth, that is moving. Polaris is almost in line with the Earth's polar axis, so it is stationary in the sky. In the film days, you could expose a star trail for 30 minutes or even up to an hour. In the digital age, too long of an exposure creates unsightly digital noise. So I take a series of one to two minute photos in a sequence with a one second interval between them. I later combine the series on my computer to create the star trail. The effect is the same as one long exposure. In this case, I shot 30 frames at two minutes for each frame, which equals 60 minutes of total time. This view is from the Forest Canyon Overlook at Rocky Mountain National Park. Even at about 2.30 a.m., several cars were traveling along Trail Ridge Road through the park. A setting first quarter moon is lighting up the interior walls of this ancient pueblo called Lomaki in Wupatki National Monument, just north of Flagstaff, Arizona. This turned out to be a perfect setting to show the star trails with a man-made structure. Here I used a moderate telephoto lens to narrow the field of view and create a more abstract composition over Fajada Butte in Chaco Culture National Historic Park in New Mexico. This view looks toward the south and southwest as the stars travel left to right. I've been experimenting with very close up angles of flora, which my wife calls botanicals. For all the night sky photos, I'm shooting at a very wide aperture, so the depth of field is very shallow. The out-of-focus stars produce an interesting background. The brighter stars stand out, and you can recognize the constellation Scorpius here and the Milky Way. NASA hosts a website called Astronomy Picture of the Day, where two astronomers choose interesting images of astronomy-related subjects. Most of them are deep sky objects from ground-based professional and amateur telescopes or space-based telescopes. This was the APOD for December 24th, 2015. In the crater of Haleakala National Park, an ai plant or a fern grows out of lava formation. The bright stars in the background from left to right are Alfred in Hydra, Procyon in Canis Minor, and Betelgeuse in Orion. And you can see the vague outline of Orion on the right side. Here's a Mexican drooping juniper tree in Big Bend National Park in Texas. You can see the shape of Scorpius with Antares in the middle and the Milky Way. A very bright Saturn and Mars is above the teapot of Sagittarius on the left, while, while the bright white object to the right of Scorpius is Jupiter. Beyond the Ponderosa Pines in Yellowstone National Park is the northern sky. You can see the familiar shape of the Big Dipper. Two of its Dipper stars point up to Polaris, the North Star, and the Little Dipper. The ISS is another object in the sky that can be photographed. Sometimes I try for longer exposures that show the path of the space station across the sky. This is a single five-minute exposure in the Moraine Park section of Rocky Mountain National Park just before dawn in 2013. The station goes right to left over the park. The camera was on an iOption sky tracker, which is a tracking mount that follows the motion of the stars. So you can do long exposures and not get star trailing. The landscape is slightly blurred as you can see on the horizon, but it is not too apparent.
Here's the International Space Station from Acadia National Park in Maine. I did not use a tracking mount, so the stars are moving in this single frame, which is a five minute and 30, minute, 30 second exposure. People ask what I shoot when I'm home in New York City. There's quite a lot that can be seen and photographed from the city. The buildings and the skyline become the landscape and the same principles apply when composing images. Continuing with the ISS theme, we can see it even from Central Park. Here it is the long dashes diagonally across the frame. This view looks south toward Midtown Manhattan in January of this year. The station is going uh, right to left from the horizon to the top of the picture. Due to the brightness of the sky, I shoot much shorter exposures, then combine them to give a sense of motion across the sky. The moon is always a great object to shoot and can be seen from anywhere. These moon photos were shot with telephoto lenses of varying focal lengths. As you might have guessed, night sky photography involves either staying up late or getting up early before sunrise, as in this case, to see a crescent moon rising between apartment buildings. This was another APOD of the moonrise over Manhattan from a park called Eagle Rock Reservation in West Orange, New Jersey. I'm about 13 miles from New York City, shooting through a lot of atmosphere. Things like the moon and sun look very orange or reddish when low on the horizon. The last rays of the setting sun behind me is reflected in the glass of the lower Manhattan buildings. Sometimes you get very lucky out there. When shooting the moonrise with fellow AAA members in Central Park, we notice airplanes taking off from LaGuardia Airport. All would go wide of the moon except for one, which looked like it would intersect the rising disk. And it did as the moon cleared the apartment rooftops. The crescent is probably my favorite phase. A group of us went to a park in Queens to look west over Manhattan on the first night of Eid, marking the end of the Muslim month of Ramadan. The Empire State Building was lit green in honor of the holiday, and some clouds made the sky even more dramatic. Often the crescent moon will line up with the Statue of Liberty as it sits when you look from Battery Park along the harbor. This is a photograph that can be calculated by using an app like the photographer's ephemeris. Just this past Sunday, the two-day-old crescent moon was visible through some very high clouds, producing a mysterious photo. This and the next picture were shot from a reservoir in Central Park, looking to the west side. Another crescent visible in the sky is Venus, above this Manhattan apartment building. Even with binoculars, the crescent shape is apparent. A few days before, Venus and Mercury were about 10 degrees apart, and I photographed in between two apartment towers that face Central Park. So yes, you can see planets from New York City. I'd read where many New Yorkers had left the city during the coronavirus pandemic, and the many unlit apartments in these buildings attest to that. Here's a wider view with the planets on the right and a contrail from an airplane flying above. At Jenny Jump, where the UACNJ is located, there is less pollution and a darker sky. I photographed Comet Lovejoy on a very cold night, January night in 2015. An airplane flew through the picture, normally a bad thing, but in this case, I think the colorful streaks added another dimension to the picture. The ISS made a flyover as a full moon was rising last May. Normally, it is dark enough to do longer exposures but the moon really lit up the sky. So I sh shot eight second exposures and combined 22 of them to make this photo, showing the ISS moving from right to left. Often Gil Jeffer will turn on the research laser that sits in the shed near the observatories. He says that it is actually a pulse laser, which appears as a continuous beam to the eye and to a camera. 
The sponsor of this uh, research project is the New Jersey Institute of Technology Center for Solar Terrestrial Physics. And the goal is to measure buoyancy waves in the atmosphere over urban heat islands, such as the New York City area. Eclipses are another astronomical event e easily photographed. This was the first total solar eclipse I saw and photographed, which is visible in Spitsbergen Svabard, far north of the Arctic Circle, where I also took the aurora photos. It was a remarkable sight, about 10 to 11 degrees above the horizon. The icy and snowy landscape provided a stark contrast to the eclipse. Everyone you see looks bundled up because they, they are. It was two degrees Fahrenheit at the start of the eclipse. In the classes I teach, I stress clothing as an important piece of equipment. I think I'm wearing almost everything I packed in this photo taken about an hour before the eclipse. It was much warmer in August 2017 during the total eclipse that year, which my wife and I saw from Madras, Oregon. You can see an amazing amount of detail in the solar corona here. I combined nine frames shot at varying exposures and blended it together to show the detail. Here's a sequence showing the partial phases, totality, and then the moon moving off the sun's face during the 2017 eclipse. I used the solar filter to photograph the partial phases and then took off the filter for during totality. Last July, I traveled down to Chile to view the eclipse that crossed that country and Argentina. With a wide angle lens, I photographed from the start of the eclipse through totality and as the sun was still eclipsed, it set behind the mountains. This one was similar to the Svabard eclipse in that it was low on the horizon and easy to watch. My goal is to show objects in the sky in relation to familiar landscapes and to give a more human perspective to the universe around us. I hope you enjoyed the photographs. Even during these strange times, go outside and look up and take in the beauty of the sky. I do have some upcoming workshops later in the year, still scheduled as a September 11th to 13th three-day workshop at the South Rim of the Grand Canyon. I believe this workshop is full, but you can check on the Grand Canyon Conservancy website to make sure. A week later, on September 19th, I'll do a, an evening workshop during the Flagstaff Star Party in that city. I also conduct classes in New York for the AAA Check my website or AAA.org for more on those classes. We may do a Zoom night sky photography class starting up in June. Feel free to email me, email me or message me on Instagram or Facebook with any questions. And thanks very much for inviting me to talk.